So we are going to transition now to Laura Edwards. She's our state climatologist based in the Aberdeen Regional Center. And I will pass the virtual microphone over to Laura. All right, great. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so I was originally scheduled for about 45 minutes. So I'm gonna have to compress this down. I'm gonna talk a little fast here today. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna kind of hit on two topics today. First is weather and pesticide drift and some information we have um, that's weather related um, about inversions and drift and some resources that you can use here in South Dakota um, that can hopefully help you um, when you're making your decisions to spray, not spray and for your record keeping and, and that kind of thing. Um, the other part that I'm going to cover is the climate outlook for the rest of the spring and summer. So um, some hot off the press information that came out all well, just about a week ago now um, that I can share with you. So we're going to go right into it. We're going to talk about inversions first, um, temperature inversions. So you hear a lot about this, right? And this has been a, a hot topic, especially with the last few years of dicamba application over the top on soybeans um, as uh, that those labels explicitly say you cannot apply during an inversion. But what's an inversion? So that's looking at the, the temperature as we look up in the atmosphere, um, looking up in the vertical. So when you have uh, warm air that wants to rise, okay? Um, and more often we have warmer air down near the surface, cooler air above, and you get some good mixing, you know, so, some uh, pretty good, you know, air movement typically. Um, in an inversion situation, you kind of have that upside down where you have cooler air below closer to the surface and warmer air above. That cooler air likes to sink and kind of stay where it's at. It doesn't want to move. So that's called an inversion. That's a very stable atmosphere situation. Um, the challenge with inversions and why you um, you cannot spray those dicamba products and it's recommended you don't spray other anything during that time is because those inversions will trap your droplets. They can remain airborne for many hours. Um, and I'll show you um, some, some information about inversions and how long they last. Um, and when that inversion does, when the air starts to move, when the inversion breaks down, then those droplets that are still airborne can move off target and you can have drift um, much later after, after the time that you applied. Um, so we'll talk about how inversions develop here. That's called the temperature inversion. Most commonly, they're really just driven by the sun. Um, sunlight during the day and dark at night. And we see this very commonly here um, with inversions setting up during the night and breaking down during the day. So we have the sunshine during the daytime hours. We call that shortwave radiation where the sun is heating the surface um, and everything on it, you know, buildings, you know, abandoned vehicles and all that kind of thing. Um, and so we're gaining all that heat down at the surface and the ground is warming up. So again, you got warm air below the cooler air. And so you get mixing and, um, and pretty good, you know, usually pretty good air movement. When you have nighttime conditions, we have what we call long wave radiation that's cooling everything. Um, so that warm air is rising, cooler air is settling in down near the surface. So that is what's setting up our inversion, just the sun setting by itself. Um, cool, and that long wave radiation cools the surface at night. Get to sunrise, sun comes up, the sky brightens, and right away, um, early morning hours, we have that warmer air above that colder air, as you see. And, um, and we get those inversions all the way up until the sun has enough time to heat the surface again and kind of start that cycle all over again. There are other kinds of inversions, you know, in a meteorological sense, but we don't worry about those other ones too often. Really these temperature inversions is driven by heating and cooling during the day and night. Um, are, are ones that we're most concerned about because they happen very, very often. So another thing, you know, so what about clouds? Uh, you know, I've 
so far talked about clear sky, you know, without worrying about clouds. So clouds can complicate things a little bit. Um, if you have solid cloud cover, like you do on the left side of the screen there, that cloud cover kind of blocks that radiation, um, that long wave radiation at night from cooling. So you typically don't get an inversion. Kind of acts like a blanket and everything kind of stays similar. You kind of, you guys are, are um, pretty smart. You guys watch the weather a lot, I know. So you'll see this when you have a cloudy day where the temperature from day to night doesn't change too much. It might just be a few degrees, maybe 10 degrees. Um, and that's because of the cloud cover. It blocks the radiation coming in at, during the day and blocks it at night. So you get, um, you, you typically don't have an inversion. When you have partial cloud cover, that's why it gets a little trickier. Um, so you can sometimes get a, what we call a weak inversion, something that's less strong, um, or or maybe no inversion. So it kind of depends how much cloud cover you have, kind of the timing on it, um, you know, when it comes in, when it goes away, that kind of thing. So again, a, a little trickier there. You can have an inversion still with when you have partial cloud cover. I would say if you have clouds that are less than maybe a quarter of the sky, that's more like a clear sky condition. And, and I, would, I would treat that more like clear skies. One thing to keep in mind too, is when you have a very strong temperature difference from day to night, um, that's often another indicator that you're very likely to have, a, have an inversion set up. So uh, we have a network of weather stations here across South Dakota that we call the Mesonet the Mesonet network and we have about 30 stations right now. I'll show you a map of those in a minute. Uh, we keep adding more stations to the network, but we've uh, added some extra thermometers on, on the stations so that we can directly measure inversion. So now we're taking temperature at about one meter high, about three feet, and then at about three meters, about 10 feet. Um, so that we get the, the actual measurement of the temperature difference between that low and upper level, right near the ground, right where you guys are applying as ground applicators. Um, and so we've taken all this data, this is from 2019. We've been doing this since 2016, 17, and we get basically the same answer almost all the time. And so you'll look at this graph, um, see if I can do a laser pointer. Okay, so here you're looking at midnight to midnight, across across the, the left to right, the x-axis. Um, looking vertically here, this is the percent of time. So that's why you see like a decimal number out of 100. Um, you know, the percent of time that is in an inversion for each hour of the day, okay? Um, and this is just the data for Eastern South Dakota because we have the most stations out that way. So the gray areas are what are um, the, the nighttime hours. The yellow, yellow shaded areas is the first hour of the day after sunrise and the last two hours of the day before sunset. So the reason why I show you this is because again, looking at dicamba over the top and soybeans, that's about the most restrictive label we, can, we know of right now. Um, they have these restrictions on there where you cannot spray at nighttime, you cannot spray the first hour of the day and the last two hours of the day. Um, and this is, this is why, because inversions are very common um, at those times of day. Now, if you remember, 2019 was a very wet year, right? Um, but the pattern of inversions don't, doesn't change just how often, maybe. Um, so looking at these lines, blue was May, orange was June, gray was July. So you can see each, you know, you look at, um, say, the month of June, that's the orange one here. Very... Um, very common, about half the time um, at midnight, one o'clock, we'd see inversions. Again, at sunrise, you get that surface heating up, the inversion breaks down very quickly, and we see very few inversions during the day in all through those three months. And then right before, sun, right before sunset, you know, that two hours before, these inversions build up very quickly, and they actually are at their maximum about one to two hours after sunset. Um, I've been uh, working with some other weed scientists and, and climatologists, meteorologists in other states, um, in Missouri, Illinois, um, Nebraska, and elsewhere, and almost all of them have the very 
similar behavior where the inversions build up quickly at night and they're at their maximum, usually a couple hours after sunset. So here the time to avoid um, is to try to avoid spraying right before sunset because that inversion will most likely hang on all the way until the morning hours. And then when the air starts to move, those particles, those droplets are still airborne. And then that's when they move off target. Um, I hear this uh, quite a fair bit, you know, where there's maybe someone that applied in the evening before um, and there's some drift issue in the morning. They're like, well, nobody was out there in the morning. Well, it, it likely occurred uh, the night before, um, before the drift actually happened before the damage occurred. So here you go. Um, again, 2019 is a pretty wet year. When we see dry years, like 2017, um, the frequency of inversions, like here, it's like 50, 60%. In 2017, we saw more like 70 to 80% of nights with inversions. So something to think about as we're kind of sitting in drought situation right now, um, and we could see that potential for more inversions in dry years. So I kind of looked at the weather data there a little bit. Um, we also looked at uh, the, the Mesonet guys and I, um, we also looked at inversions and comparing kind of different rules of thumb. You know, and these are kind of maybe um, things you hear about. Maybe uh, some of these are actually mentioned on a label somewhere. Um, so we kind of came up with um, comparing our inversion measurements, our actual measurements to these rules of thumb, looking at May, June, and July. Um, you know, in that, in that grow, part of the growing season. Looking at the orange bars, if you simply avoid the nighttime plus two hours at the beginning of the day and two hours at the end of the day, if you just avoid that, you will avoid 70 to 80 percent of the inversions, just not even knowing anything about the weather, really. Just avoid nighttime in the, the first and last part of the day, and that would, that would take um, yeah, that, that would be mostly inversions right there. Uh, the second rule of thumb was the blue bars, um, where if you look at the minimum temperature of the day and wait for the temperature to rise three degrees, three degrees Fahrenheit, um, would, that, would that help you? Well, yeah, you would avoid 40 to 50% of the inversions, basically everything in the morning, right? And, but it wouldn't help you on the nighttime side, but it, it would help you avoid the morning inversions. If you're only looking at wind speed less than three miles an hour, that's the gray bar. If you're only looking at wind speeds less than three miles an hour, not a great indicator of inversions. Wind speed alone um, does not necessarily tell you there's inversion and that's 13 to 28% of the time. So try to look at something else other than just wind speed. We have seen inversions with wind speeds as high as 10, 12 miles an hour at times. Um, so inversions can happen a lot. Of, it's not that common, but it does happen. Um, if you guys are interested in watching a short little video about morning inversions, this is a cool little video um, that Tom Wolf and, and, uh, and those guys did. They're up in Canada, so they have a fun accent. Um, and, and they have a series, a, a few series of videos about sprayer mist, exploding sprayer mist is what they call it. Um, so I encourage you to check that out too. Um, it's a good one about kind of what I just told you about morning inversions um, and why you should avoid them. So other things, other than, you know, those rules of thumb, avoiding nighttime and the first and, per first and last part of the day and other things, what are some other clues that there might be an inversion out there? Well, one, um, maybe you see morning fog. Um, this is um, the road where we are, just taking a picture down the road one day. Um, you see that fog sitting out there. That means it's very stable air mass. And that's a visual, right? That your spray droplets, just like the water droplets in the air, are just hanging around um, and can drift and move off target when the air starts to move. They're not evaporating and they're not attaching to any, not connecting to anything. Uh, this is a later morning picture. Um, uh, say maybe nine, 10 o'clock or so, I can't remember what time of day it was, but it was morning, morning time where you can see that inversion kind of breaking. You, you can kind of see the, the top of this inversion kind of fading um, and kind of mixing up in a way. So that's probably a pretty good time to start getting ready to get out there um, when that inversion's breaking. Um, that kind of mid-morning up until early afternoon is really prime time 
because um, we do see some some more wind in the afternoon a lot of times but that that's about a couple hours after sunrise great time when you see this kind of thing and then version breaking up the fog going away um, that's that's a good time so you can also smell them and I kind of joke like inversions are kind of like Las Vegas right what happens in the inversion stays in the inversion and that includes odors say from industrial processes uh, manure spreading um, or even like chimney smoke burn barrels those kinds of things you can smell them quite a long ways away you can sometimes see the smoke kind of go up and kind of drift off level um, that's another indicator there might be inversion going on um, so uh, there's other ways um, you can tell too um, you can also hear it sometimes. Inversion layers act kind of like echo chambers, where sound um, kind of per, you know um, uh, can go through and, and and carry very very long distances. So where I'm at here northeast of of Aberdeen, I can hear the the Friday night races at the fairgrounds, which is probably I don't know seven eight miles away, as a crow flies from where we are. Um, and usually in those first few nights in May, we get surprise like where are those race cars well you know that's at the fairgrounds similar terrain something you guys probably see and hear quite a bit across the countryside um if any of you are fishermen you might know this too or golfers if you're out early in the morning on the lake um you can hear voices across the lake and noises um on those very calm quiet mornings so again those are all kind of clues that there might be inversions um, an inversion in place. All right, so how do you know when there's an inversion like for real? And so we've developed this thing we call the spray tool, which is exactly for you guys um, using our Mesonet data, our weather station data. So the website is there, um, mesonet.sdstate.edu slash spray. And right here is um, all the weather information that I believe uh, would help would fulfill your weather record keeping requirements that Valerie just mentioned. So that includes temperature, humidity, wind speed, um, wind direction. Um, we tried to take all the elements we could um, out of some of the most restricted labels we could find. That's the the dicamba over the top applications and a couple other chemicals, um, and we tried to put on this one website, this one tool, almost anything that you would need um, to determine your spray conditions. So for these weather stations that we have, they're updated every five minutes. So they're about as current, as real time as you can get. Um, looking at the top right here, we've got a, a block for temperature and humidity. And it gives you the current temperature, the current dew point, um, relative humidity and percent. Um, Delta T I'll talk about in a little bit and then if there's an inversion or not so these things the little dots here you'll see um, in red yellow green kind of a stoplight color um, we aren't telling you exactly go or no go but this is advisory for you guys just to consider like oh yeah there's an inversion out there maybe we want to wait um, maybe go another time um, that color for the inversion will also show here red, yellow, or green, whatever the color is. Okay. Um, here on the wind, on the left side here, you see this yellow. It's kind of like a caution. Again, red, yellow, green, kind of like the stoplight saying, well, the average wind speed's 12, but it's gusting to 19 at this time. That's kind of in the yellow zone. We got a wind gust here. And we also are using the EPA formula to calculate boom height wind speed. So again, that's a dicamba specific number. Um, so at this case, it was 11 miles an hour um, at that time. Uh, also have sunrise, sunset. Again, you need to know what time of day you're spraying. Um, and then also too, it says NWS forecast. We, we do usually have the National Weather Service forecast piece in there. The screenshot just didn't capture that. So. Um, Again, and we um, have have worked it out with the the Department of Ag um, as of a year or two ago that you are able to use this for your weather record keeping. Um, when you go into it now, there's also a link there that you can send an email with those exact weather conditions uh, to yourself. So you'll say send spray uh, conditions to email or something like that. Um, so then you have that record in your email as well 
to um, verify when you're out there and what the weather conditions were. We have little help screens too. Again, if you if you have more questions about what the red, yellow, green scale means, um, th these are the criteria we use to determine those colors. So you can go into this little help screen with the um, from the spray tool, and I'll show you when we do have an inversion, when it's marginal, and when there's no inversion. Um, similarly, uh, same on wind speed. Um, we use a very conservative number, and I believe, again, this is right in line with those dicamba labels as of a couple years ago. Um, calm would be red around two miles an hour, yellow. The green go zone around three to 10 miles an hour, and then again, red and yellow above that. Uh, boom height wind speed, again, um, we, we again use that EPA formula and it's just red or green at that point. Don't really have a yellow on that one. So that is out there. Um, one other part here, I did want to go into Delta T just a little bit more because um, that's something we, we talk a lot about, um, but it can be a little, a, a bit of useful information out there. Um, very few labels, I think, actually mention it, but some do, some do. So Delta T is a thing here that we um, show. It's also called wet bulb depression. If you look in like a glossary of meteorology, something like that. So we're looking at the dry bulb temperature, which is this air temperature, uh, minus the wet bulb temperature. And so some of you may remember a thermometer with like a wet cotton wick on the end of it. That is, and you spin it around on this handle like this, a sling psychrometer. Um, that's measuring the wet bulb temperature. Um, and so we take that difference. Um, we don't actually use the wick, but we have a way to calculate that with all the weather data we have. So, um, so we show that because when you're seeing delta T is too high, that means your, your water in your solution um, in your application is evaporating very rapidly. So you're reducing your droplet size and smaller droplets are more susceptible to blow off target because they're lighter, right? So you're no longer at like your optimal droplet size. If delta T is too high, the water is evaporating too fast. Um, also, um, if you're not at the right, um, right ratio of liquid to, to solution to chemical, it, the chemical might not get taken up as effectively um, and your application might not work as well. If your delta T is too low, that means the water is not evaporating quickly enough um, and you're maintaining those those droplets in a liquid state um, again it might be more humid uh, conditions um, something like that so keeping in mind too um, that if you're looking at those overnight inversions at those temperature inversions that I've been talking about oftentimes the air is more humid right you guys might kind of know this like in the morning it's more humid than the afternoon um, so again that adds to um, you know the lifetime of those droplets they're going to hang around longer when there's more humid air more humid more humidity in the environment around them um, so that's another thing to consider so for the mesonet stations um, we use these criteria for the red yellow and green so kind of prime is that four to 15 degree um, for that delta t wet bulb and dry bulb difference um, so so just one more thing, you know, some labels require that you consider that very few, but it's another piece of information that can help tell you kind of what's the environment, what's the atmosphere like around, around there. So here's a map of all the Mesonet locations right now. Um, this last year, there, we added a station up in Campbell County at Mound City, that's a new one. Um, not all of these stations right now have inversion thermometers on them. Um, as we're trying to get more funding to add, add some of that equipment out there. Um, but this is where all the stations are right now um, that, have, that have data online. So um, I encourage you to check out those stations. Um, I will say, I know you guys probably don't need to renew now for another three years, but keep watching um, the Mesonet because they do have plans the next five years to uh, add a lot of stations to the network. Um, they're hoping to add or update 140 stations statewide um, in the next five years. That's their plan. So uh, keep an eye out um, in the next coming years for more weather stations basically in your, in your neck of the woods. 
Uh, what else is offered by the Mesonet? So in addition to the inversion information that's updated every five minutes, we have wind speed and direction, air temperature, pressure, precipitation, solar radiation. We have soil temperature and moisture at five different levels. Um, the precipitation right now is rain only, but like I said, through this upgrade that they're doing and all the new stations, they're going to change the rain gauges so that they can measure also the liquid equivalent of the snow. So there's going to be a lot of new data coming out of there all year round. So we get a good handle on precipitation all year round. There's a, a, a look at what the weather stations look like now. Um, so a lot of the new stations are going to have taller towers, I believe 10 meters. So this is what they look like now on a tripod, but they're going to be adding some taller towers out there um, in the new ones. So um, I'm looking to see if there's anything in the chat that I need to address right now. I think we're probably good. Oops. So, okay. All right, so looking at the climate outlook, I'll try to try to make this quick in the next uh, few five, 10 minutes here. Um, just looking at where we've been so far in this winter, warmer than average temperatures. Uh, this is the last four months, so since the uh, mid, mid November, late November. Warmer than average, almost everywhere except for part of the Black Hills and southwestern part of the state. So we had that two week period in February where it was a little cold, felt a little cold, um, but really we've been warmer than average overall. I don't think that's a big surprise to you. Um, but what's interesting is that this is consistent with our long-term trend. Um, looking at winter temperature, December, January, February, um, that the blue line is our long-term trend in winter temperature from 1895 through the, just now through 2021. Um, our winter season is warming faster than in, than our other seasons. And what we just saw this last winter is consistent with that. Uh, Tamara, I see your question about weather stations. Yes, you can use that in the Mesonet information for your application record sheet for your weather record keeping. Yep. Okay. Um, this is just looking at the long-term trend, just nationally speaking. Um, looking at top the annual temperature and then on the bottom two two maps there's separating into winter and summer again we see more of our warming seasonally in the winter season than the summer season what about precipitation wow it's really kind of a mixed bag and this was uh, taken a couple days ago so it's a couple days old um, but again, looking at the last four months, you see across the northern tier, really much drier than average, especially the north central, northwest, um, you know, maybe 25% of average or less over that season. Granted, it's not our wettest season anyway. Winter is actually our driest season of the year. Um, but in the fall before, we didn't get a lot of moisture either. So we did not recharge our soil moisture and we don't have snow on the ground to melt. Um, so we're in quite a big hole as far as precipitation goes. If you look down to the southeast corner of the state, you see more of the greens, blues, purples. That's wetter than average. Um, that's really just been the last few weeks, last couple of weeks. Sioux Falls has had about two and a half inches over the last couple of weeks. That's, um, that's really kind of brought them back, um, back into the black, I should say, as far as precipitation for the season goes. Um, so it's really quite recent. Again, looking at the long-term trend for at least winter precipitation, there's not a big trend in precipitation in winter season. A lot of variability though, you see a lot of ups and downs. In the last few years, we've seen more high years than low years. Um, so just this last winter was the driest winter since 2005. Um, believe it or not, it's the 21st driest winter on record out of 129 or 126 years. So, um, Really, it's actually been quite dry um, over this last winter season, driest in 15, 16 years, which is kind of unusual, not too unusual in the winter time, but annually, if we look at total precipitation, this is our long-term trend, like from early 1900s to early 2000, 2000s. Um, South Dakota is actually getting pretty wet. You guys might have noticed this already. Um, 
where South Dakota is getting wetter faster than almost anywhere else in the country. And we see more of that in the spring and fall, certainly, um, where it's offered us a lot of challenges, right, in planting and harvest. But uh, this winter proved to be quite a dry one, uh, even despite the trend. Soil moisture. So this is kind of our um, this is kind of our indicator of drought right now because we're still in the early season, just starting our wet season. Now through June is our wettest time of year. About 40% of our precipitation happens in the next three months. So soil moisture is kind of what, where we start right now. And um, this is what we call our poker chip map. Um, so we've got a, um, a stack of chips. Each one of those chips is showing the moisture at one of our soil sensors at those stations. So the white ones there don't have the sensors. We just have a station there. So you, uh, don't worry about those. Anything gray is frozen at that layer. And this was as of this morning. Um, so you could see a lot of greens and blues. Um, but the thing is, we it looks OK for now. But we're actually down about 20 to 50% on soil moisture as compared to a year ago. So even though our current drought kind of started last summer for a lot of us, we had a lot of soil moisture to kind of carry us through and the roots of our plants and crops could kind of use that moisture to carry them through the drought period. Well, we don't have that reserve so much anymore. We don't have that buffer or that bank account. So um, even though it looks okay now, um, we're really gonna rely on some timely rainfall the summer, spring and summer um, to kind of replenish our soil moisture and kind of carry our crop through. We're gonna rely on, on rainfall much more this year that we have in a few years. I'm gonna skip the next one here. Um, frost depth, this is kind of good news. So as um, kind of an artifact of having a really warm winter, um, our soils have thawed out. We saw some very deep frost layers um, there at the end of February, at the end of that cold period, but they've thawed out very rapidly. And again, that's an indicator that our soils are very dry. Um, but the upside now, especially in the southern, southeastern part of the state, is those soils have been able to take up all the rain and snow melt you guys have had over the last couple of weeks. We've seen almost nothing in the rivers as far as runoff goes. Everything's going in the soil. So that's excellent. That's exactly what we want right now. So I think um, I'm a little more optimistic on the south as far as how you're starting off this growing season, at least in the shallow, shallow soil moisture you know, the seed bed area, that kind of thing. Um, we are already seeing some, some. Um, I'd say we're already seeing some weeds grow. I noticed some crabgrass growing up here in Aberdeen. Um, in my garden and yard, you know, there's some greening up early. So uh, something to consider. I'm, I'm guessing Garrett will talk about this too, getting on those weeds early because um, the soils are warm enough um, or they will be warm enough soon for those, those things to emerge and start coming up. U.S. Drought Monitor, this is where we sit right now. About 73% of the state is in drought of some level. We're really watching the north, central, northwest for worsening conditions um, as they've really missed out a lot of the rainfall last few weeks. Um, southeast has had some gradual improvements. I'd expect we might see some more uh, improvements following the rain that we just saw this last few days. Um, here's a close up of South Dakota. Just to give you an idea, um, this map is updated every Thursday. So um, I welcome you guys. If you have pictures to share, comments on drought or no drought, whatever is happening in your backyard or on your farm, um, I'd love to see what, what's going on around the state since I don't get to travel as much as I as we did before. Um, hopefully that will come back soon, but um, I'd love to hear from every corner of the state kind of what's going on um, on drought because I can share that with the drought monitor authors and, and every week we have the opportunity. Um, just a, a, a little more concern about drought here and that looking at the far right, that's where we are right now. We're in the most area of drought um, since 2013, since 2013 at this time of year, it was just about April, first week in April before it got wet. So you look at that, that was the end of that 2012 drought right there. So that's why I'm a little bit worried in that, um, you know, we've had a very warm season so far, warm March, that's more like 2011, or sorry, 2012, um, how that drought kind of started. It was dryness the season before, and they had a warm early start to the growing season in 2012. You know, um, 
just something I'm keeping in the back of my mind where, where we're kind of at a tipping point right now where things can get worse or they can get better. The next couple of months is gonna determine a lot of that. Um, I'm gonna skip this right now, but just to say La Nina looks like it's gonna hang in here. Um, might go towards a neutral condition for the summer, but if La Nina hangs on, we have this kind of data to show us how does that correspond to corn yields historically. Um, I don't have this for any of the crops, but it's kind of a mixed bag here in South Dakota. La Nina sometimes means winners, sometimes not so much winners. We see ups and downs above average yields. So, um, you know, it's, it's unclear, I'd say, what La Nina tells us. If you look further east, Iowa and Minnesota, they do tend to have lower yields of corn in La Nina seasons. So um, maybe an opportunity here, if we can stay out of drought, um, that we have opportunity to, to do some, uh, at least get on average, if not higher corn yield. Looking ahead here, sorry, Amanda, I'm going a little bit long here. Okay. <laughs> um, next seven days looks pretty quiet. Really the next couple days is when we're gonna see some rain in the Southeast. Uh, corner of the state, quarter of the state, really still dry up in the north, northwest. That's what this is showing. Really the greens are less than a half an inch, really not a lot of moisture expected over the next weekend. After that, it turns very warm and dry. Look at this, eight to 14 days out. This is the first week in April. Really high probability right over South Dakota of warmer than average temperatures and drier than average. That's basically how we're gonna start April. Um, we're going to bounce back real quick to warm and dry. Um, as we look at April overall, this will update next week on the 31st, but the outlook as it stood a week ago does favor warmer than average temperatures in April and kind of that southwestern corner also favoring drier than average that's on the right. So not real optimistic news. Um, we really would like to see some above average rainfall. That'd be really nice. Um, so again, every drop is going to matter, especially when you have warmer than average temperatures. Um, that can really um, use our moisture quickly if we have warm temperatures for evaporation and, and evapotranspiration. Looking at April through June, very similar kind of pattern to what I just showed for April, warmer than average temperatures across almost all the lower 48 still favoring dry over the Rockies and kind of our southwest corner of the state. This isn't where I get too, too worried just yet, kind of, um, but when we look deeper into the summer, the middle of the summer, June, July, and August, this is where I really worry about drought worse. Like, I think we can see some improvements and kind of maybe some ups and downs in drought this spring, might see some areas that, that get better. Um, but right now, uh, indications are looking at warmer and drier than average across the north central states and in the northwest. Um, so what, what might that mean? You know, maybe your crops will mature a little faster. I think planting is going to go just slick um, very quickly this spring. Um, herbicides, though, if you've got dry air, um, the dry environment, um, sometimes they don't work as well. You know, you need a little moisture to activate that and get your plant growing to take up the chemical. Um, so maybe a couple concerns there on the drought side. Um, I know we don't have much irrigation across the state, but if you do, something else to keep in mind um, to irrigate this spring and summer. Uh, no big surprise here, looking at the drought outlook. This is at least through uh, June, through the end of June. They're expecting drought to hold on in some way, shape or form or to be there at the end of June, the yellow area, showing that they think drought would return um, by the end of June, so um, in, into, in into Nebraska. So um, uh, again, I know it's kind of a tough outlook right now, um, but hopefully, uh, even if we're drier than average, we get timely rains to carry us through. That, we, that That's really what we're gonna rely on more this year. Um, again, uh, warmer than average. I think very good planting conditions right now. Um, we do see some dramatic swings in temperature. So when you have drought conditions, you have very dry air that can warm and cool very quickly. That means higher potential for inversions. Um, it also means potentially some very cold nights or mornings. Um, in 2017, we saw some really late frost, like third week in June up in the north central part of the state. 
Um, just this coming Monday, I'm looking at the forecast for Aberdeen. Our low is 38, our high is going to be 80. So it takes some really dry air to have 40 plus degree temperature change from day to night. Um, precipitation outlook, a little uncertain here for the spring, but as we get into the summer, it does look to lean a little drier. So keeping that in mind, we don't have that soil moisture buffer to carry us through. Um, cocoa rods, we love to have volunteers take measurements of precipitation, rain, snow, hail um, across the state. Let me know if you're interested. Um, I do have some rain gauges here. If you're, super, if you're interested and you just need a rain gauge, it's free to sign up. You report on your smartphone or computer. Um, a really great record keeping tool again for you guys uh, to keep track of rainfall um, at your own farm in your backyard. So um, I will skip right ahead here. Sorry, I went a little long, Amanda. I had a little more information than I thought I did. So. I'm also on Twitter and Facebook if you want to catch me there. <laughs> 